Hi, good morning. Thank you for coming to listen to this, this talk, um, which is new to me, so I may have some rough edges. Thank you, by the way, to Katie Rice for all her help this week and for handing around that handout. So the history of nature writing in a nutshell, here's Thoreau writing in 1852, all the phenomena of nature need to be seen from the point of view of wonder and awe. He pretty much invented na nature writing. It's, a, it's, a, it's an American genre, of course, uh, idea that nature could be a, a subject for writing is uh, it's completely a good concept of the, that comes with wilderness and the sense of frontier. By the second half of the 20th century, some people felt as if they had had more than enough wonder and awe. <laughs> so one of them wrote this. I love, I love, Katie did this to me, I love it. Nature inspires a painfully limited set of responses in nature writers, in all caps, reverence, awe, piety, mystical oneness. Does anybody know who that is? What piece that is? Ooh, good. <laughs> I, can, uh, I can take all sorts of liberties here, I'm thinking. <laughs> Nobody? That's Joyce Carol Oates in an essay called a Against Nature from 1988. She, she and a lot of other people around that time sort of gave, gave nature writing a, a kick in the pants. And a lot of the work that came out in the 90s and 2000s is, is more interesting and, and resists that uh, painfully limited set of responses. So nearly everything I write is about place in one way or another. I write about the place where I was born. I write about the places where I've traveled. I write about the place where I live now. My work gets anthologized in nature writing books. <laughs> And yet, and yet, whenever somebody tries to give me one of those nature writing books, I feel something kind of small and ugly rise up inside me. <laughs> this, this resistance, I know, is, is partly my fear of being bored. I'm very afraid of being bored. And a lot of nature writing bores me. Sometimes it's boring because the action is so predictable, right? A wounded man, usually a man, sometimes a woman, goes into the woods and um, sees the stars for the first time in years because he or she has been living in a city where pollution and lights obscure the stars. Uh, he, he learns to kill things with his bare hands and to poop without toilet paper. <laughs> and then a few months later, he comes out of the woods healed and whole. <laughs> I've read that story before. <laughs> um, other times it's boring because the only thing that happens, happens to the natural world. Ice melts, the river thaws, the sun sets, the seasons change. You've read that story before too, I think. Um, it, it can sometimes, nature writing can sometimes be boring at the level of idea. It seems to me that a lot of nature writing just tells me over and over and over again that nature, particularly wilderness, is good. It's Innocent, pure, pristine, untouched, and virginal, and of course, humans are bad. We are destructive, despoilers, rampaging, pillaging, and conquering great nature. All that self-loathing seems a little bit self-indulgent to me. Um, and plenty of people have written about this. William Cronin has written about it in really interesting ways. So I, I, I won't say now more, more here, but. Worse, it seems to me, some nature writers aren't self-loathing enough. <laughs> they locate the bad, destructive, etc. behavior elsewhere in other human beings, not themselves. So they write to instruct the rest of us on how to behave morally. I am very, very, very resistant to moral instruction in all forms, particularly literary. They set themselves up as, as gurus, and gurudom is boring. Also, it's intellectually bankrupt. Readers stop reading the work of gurus. They just buy it and put it on their bookshelves in prominent places. And gurus stop being rigorous with themselves. They get lazy. All they have to do is go out and rub up against nature for a little while and produce a piece of writing, and people will buy it. Okay. Ah. 
You know what? I, th I, I, I thought I'm not. I'm going to try not to be self-indulgent here, but I will. I'll tell you a story. <laughs> a few years ago, I went to a, a talk in Lynchburg, Virginia, by one of the most famous nature writers in America, maybe the most famous nature writer in America, but I'm too sane and sober at this hour to name him. <laughs> maybe later. But he, so he, he, he read this piece. It was an amazing piece about leaving through the back door of his, his cabin in the Oregon woods. I just want to keep it in my hand and going down to the creek and, and filling a bucket with water and bringing it back to his cabin. I think that's what pretty much what happened in that whole piece. <laughs> <laughs> Took a bucket down to the creek, filled the bucket with water, and returned home. And at, you know, there was a very big audience of people who were really, really crazy about this guy and his work, and, and who really loved that piece. And they, um, one of them, they had lots of questions for him, but one guy at the end, toward the end of the Q&A, raised his hand and said, I'm just going to call him Henry. Henry, he said, Henry, tell us how to live our lives. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, I, I, I thought two things. I thought one is I'm going to like crawl out of my own skin here. And, <laughs> and the other was I thought, well, there's only one answer to that question, right? <laughs> right? You know, oh, Joe, only you can figure out how to lead your own life. Right? But, but this nature writer actually answered that question. <laughs> that, uh, it put me off nature writing for a while. And partly, this is, this is a smaller thing, but my, partly I, I, I feel some resistance that's about class. Privilege, it seems to me, is the great unspoken of a lot of nature writing. You know, not everyone can afford to take three months off to hike the Appalachian Trail or make a first descent of a Class 5 river in Peru. Time is expensive, the gear is expensive, the plane tickets are, are expensive. And uh, it's, just, it's just often goes unacknowledged in a lot of this work. So given all this resistance, which has taken me 10 minutes to outline, you're probably thinking, why are you talking today about place in writing? Because resistance is interesting. Resistance is very interesting to me. The fact that it's missing from so much of nature writing is what, it, for me, is problematic about a lot of nature writing. I do think it's possible for writing to be saturated in place and still not be boring. And all the examples I copied for you are, are examples of writing and writers I, I love. It seems to me that, that they're up to many things in this work, and, and, and I'll talk more specifically about particular pieces in a minute, but what three things they all do is, is make place inseparable from, from action or the, the story itself, and also place is inseparable from character in these pieces. Also, these pieces all surprise at the level of idea and form, to go back to Greg's talk yesterday. They're, they're playful in a way that a lot of nature writing is not playful. It is... Um, you know, reverence, awe, piety, mystical oneness. These are profoundly unhumorous, unironic um, attitudes. So before I start, two things. A little bit of work on your part might be required. I'm going to suggest a writing exercise that we might have time for at the end. You can do it if you want to, but if you don't, I'm not checking on you. Also, I'm, I'm only going to talk about place in the outdoor sense, sort of landscape. I know John's going to talk tomorrow about in interior spaces. So for the purposes of this talk, exterior spaces. So the, the first thing I, I want to ask you to do, and, and write it down if you want to, or just make this a pure thought exercise, is, is to picture the landscape that shaped you. And, and by that, I don't necessarily mean the landscape where you grew up, as in, which is what Annie Dillard's writing about, of course, in, um, in An American Childhood, in that wonderful bit about Pittsburgh. It, it could be an adopted landscape, as Isaac Dennison writes about, in, in Out of Africa. And it doesn't have to be beautiful. It also doesn't have to be big. For now, I won't. I won't read these. But put that in your head. I'm gonna. I'm gonna read just a little bit. 
from um, this wonderful essay that I'm stealing way too much for this talk by Barry Lopez called Landscape and Narrative. I think of two landscapes, and I'm just going to read about the first one right now. This is Lopez talking. One outside the self and the other within. The external landscape is the one we see. Not only the line and color of the land and its shading at different times of the day, but also its plants and animals in season, its weather, its geology, the record of its climate and evolution. If you walk up, say, a dry arroyo in the Sonoran Desert, you will feel a mounding and rolling of sand and silt beneath your foot that is distinctive. You will anticipate the crumbling of the sedimentary earth in the arroyo bank as your hand reaches out. And in that tangible evidence, you will sense a history of water in the region. Perhaps a black-throated sparrow lands in a palo verde bush, the resiliency of the twig under the bird, that precise shade of yellowish green against the milk blue sky, the fluttering whir of the arriving sparrow, are what I mean by the landscape. Draw on the smell of the creosote bush or clack of stones together in the dry air. Feel how, ho feel how light is the desiccated dropping of the kangaroo rat. Study an animal track obscured by the wind. These are all elements of the land, and what makes the landscape comprehensible are the relationships between them. One learns the landscape, finally, not by knowing the name or identity of everything in it. Seems important to me, because I have no head for taxonomy or name. But by perceiving the relationships in it, like that between the sparrow and the twig, the difference between the relationships and the elements is the same as that between written history and a catalog of events. So anyway, when you, when you think about the, this landscape that shaped you, when you and, 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 and try the task, it seems to me, is to, is, to, is to get it in your head and then try in words to set down what it is that you're, you're seeing, smelling, hearing, tasting, even touching. In, in your head, um, you know, be, be as specific and detailed as you can and, and, and of course hit as many of the sensors as you, as you possibly can, but, but think about climate, think about topography, rivers, mountains, glaciers, flora and fauna, roads, buildings, is it rural, is it urban, is it suburban, um, you know, what part of the country is it, longitude, latitude, even start thinking sort of metaphoric, m metaphorically, and it's the kind of place where that, that feels to me like the, the beginning to, to think about a landscape that you know very, very, very well and that, that feels important to you, maybe even in ways that you, you, don't, you, you don't fully understand. Character. It, it seems to me that in, in, you know, in every moment, of course, we're looking for congruence between you know, what's happening on the inside and what's happening on the outside. And what, what do we want? We want safety and comfort sometimes, and sometimes we want risk and danger. I'm not going to talk about my own work here, but I, I, for reasons I, I did not fully understand at the time, and I, I think maybe I only understand now, 10 or 15 years later, I, I began my memoir with the 1964 Good Friday earthquake, which at 9.4 on the Richter scale is still the biggest earthquake ever to hit North America. I was only a year old. I have no memory of this earthquake. I do have a, I, I remember the aftershocks, which continued for years and years and, and actually did a lot of damage. But I, I think there's some, in some way I absorbed my mother's, I was alone with my mother when it happened. My father was at work. I think I absorbed my mother's fear and, and her hypervigilance, and also a sense that the, that the land was not stable, that it, was, that it, that it, it didn't care about us, and that, that at any moment it might um, swallow us up. I mean, I, 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 I probably shouldn't make this connection casually, but I think to, to some degree the experience of that earthquake for people who lived through it w was a little bit like 9-11, and, and you thought, you know, 
Am I right? We all thought, is this, is this it? Is this, is this the big thing, everything that happened on that morning? Or is it just the precursor to something even more apocalyptic and, and worse? And it took a while for us to understand that as horrible as that was, it, that, that was it. Um, so terror. I remember my, my mother's terror, I think. So you, you might think for a minute about the ways in which that, that landscape has has, has shaped you. Oh, and, and the, th the thing to say, the thing, the insight that came to me, it's only one insight that came to me in the whole course of writing that memoir, and I, I haven't had another one this big since then. It's, it's that in some ways the fact that, the, that the, the land was so dangerous did not make me run for safety. It did not, it made me instead want to control the risk. So it, ma it made me want to risk my life constantly and put myself in danger, um, uh, almost as a yeah, it's a control device, I'm sure. Um, so the second, and this is the last long passage I'll read from Lopez, but the, the second thing he says about landscape that, that's, so, that's so wonderful is, is the, the, second, the second landscape is the interior one, a kind of projection within a person of a part of the exterior landscape. Relationships in the exterior landscape include those that are named and discernible. I think I'll skip a little bit of this. It's beautiful writing. Um, the speculations, intuitions, and formal ideas we refer to as mind are a set of relationships in the interior landscape with purpose and order. Some of these are obvious, many impenetrably subtle. The shape and character of these relationships in a person's thinking, I believe, are deeply influenced by where on this earth one goes. What one touches, the patterns one observes in nature, the intricate history of one's life in the land, even a life in the city, um, where, where wind, the chirp of birds, the line of a falling leaf are known. These thoughts are arranged further according to the thread of one's moral, intellectual, and spiritual development. And here's, here's a line that seems really, really to matter. The interior landscape responds to the character and subtlety of an exterior landscape. The shape of the individual mind is as affected by land as it is by genes. So I've, I've offered you, you know, the, que the question I'm asking you, and that, you know, again, could lead to an interesting piece of writing, is, is to think about the ways in which you know, who you are, the, 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 the interior sort of metaphoric landscape corresponds to features in the exterior or, or visible landscape. And I've, I've offered you a couple of pieces here. I'm, I'm not lingering long enough on these, these really wonderful pieces of writing, but I think I will just forgive myself for that. Um, you've got... That, wonder, that wonderful opening to the flatness by Michael Martone, um, in, in which he says many wonderful things, but it, it's flat. The Indiana, the Fort Wayne, Indiana, is flat for the people who drive through, but those who live here begin to sense a slight unevenness. Um, it's not much, a slight elevation that could be missed if you were fiddling with the radio dial. But to such a scale has my meter been calibrated. Living in a flat country, I began to read the flatness, to feel the slight disturbances in the field, to drive over it by the seat of my pants. He talks about how flatness informs the writing of the Midwest, serving as a kind of foil, a kind of blue hotel in opposition to the, to the background. And to have messed up, messed up the order of things. Oh, there's that little tiny excerpt from Gretel Ehrlich's Solace of Open Spaces about Wyoming. And I, I've offered you here, too, as with the Denison and the, um, and the Dillard pieces, you know, little bits of writing by, by somebody, Mart in Martone's case, who grew up in this place and knows it intimately, and, and, and then also by somebody who adopted this place. Gretel Ehrlich moved, moved west after, I, I think her fiancé was killed tragically or died tragically and suddenly. And, and here she's just observing the ways in which 
the wide open spaces of the West seem to shape character. People are blunt with one another, sometimes even cruel, believing honesty is stronger medicine than sympathy. Westerners, does, does this resonate? People, people in Alaska are pretty direct. It's, I've had to temper my own impulse to be direct, when I moved, particularly when I moved to the South, where people are very indirect. A little less so here. An action, you know, of, of the obvious. Can you take? Can you tell a story? That's that's the next step. Picture the place. Think about the ways in which that place, the the, the visual exterior, the visible exterior aspects of that place correspond to to in, interior metaphoric spaces in you. And then, you know, think about a, a story of something that happened to you in that place that probably could not have happened to you in, in any other place. Of course, the, the most durable model for storytelling is, you know, that, you know, there's a, a, a person wants something and there, there is some kind of obstacle to his getting that thing that he wants. In all narrative writing, of course, only trouble is interesting, as Bruce tells us person in trouble sings. And nature, of course, is capable of providing a lot of trouble. <laughs> big, big dramatic things happen, avalanches, tsunamis, earthquakes, forest fires. One, one actually interesting question to ask yourself about your place is how do people die in it? Um, what, are the, what are the ways you can die? Uh, but, but even, you know, small things can cause trouble. Mosquitoes, red ants, at a picnic, a loose dog. Um, I've, I've offered you two examples here in, in Junger's The Perfect Storm, um, which danger is you know, fully, fully launched in the, the North Atlantic on this you know, fishing boat with seven men uh, on board. And, and you know, this, this whole excerpt takes place. It, the storm is actually still rising. It's, but it's, but it's pretty terrible. And then in, in Mark Sprague's Where Rivers Change Direction, I've offered you sort of the, the intimation of danger, the possibility of danger. He's woken up at the middle of the night in this camp in Wyoming, woken by, by something, he doesn't know what, and he's, he's frightened. He thinks about his fear of bears, and he's going to have to go on a bear hunt the next day. His family owned, has anybody read this book? His family owned a dude ranch in Wyoming, and, and um, as often happens in such places, the clients will uh, shoot a wild animal and injure it, but not kill it. And then somebody more experienced has to go track that animal down and kill it, and that's what he needed to do the next day with a bear that had been shot. It's a pretty, pretty good piece. Tro trouble, of course, can be can be psychic, um, with Cheryl Strayed and Wild, um, W.G. Zabald and the Rings of Saturn, one of my, one of my favorite books about the natural world. In August 1992, he writes, when the dog days were drawing to an end, I set off to walk the county of Suffolk in the hope of dispelling the emptiness that takes hold of me whenever I have completed a long stint of work. You know, if you ask me to really put my finger on what what kind of nature writing is boring and what's really interesting, I, 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 it's it's tricky. Why is that sentence so interesting? It's partly the dog days drawing to an end, partly the authority of that voice. I don't know. I have to think about it. But another model, it seems to me, for writing about place, you know, that, that incorporates, of course, the model of somebody wants something and how there's an obstacle to his or her getting, I mean, somebody wants to climb Mount Everest and there's an obstacle to climbing Mount Everest, like that there's going to be a huge storm and it's going to kill you. Um, but another one is, is, that is, is just to bring interior and exterior landscape together in some interesting way. Here's the, la the last little bit from this this um, Lopez piece, and, and this is actually an anecdote that, it, that comes very close to the beginning with it. He's been spending time with the Nunamute Eskimos in, near Anaktuvik Pass in Alaska, and they've been talking about wolverines, which are, you know, particularly, they're not very big, 
but they're they're really really fierce, and they're and they're also r rarely seen by humans. They're pretty pretty elusive. Their their fur is really um, highly prized. So short, very very short anecdote that Lopez tells that 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 brings together in some way interior and exterior. That these these men are very laconic. Um, in their, in their storytelling. A man's hunting a wolverine from a snow machine in the spring. He followed the animal's tracks for several miles over rolling tundra in a certain valley. Soon he caught sight of a dark spot on the crest of a hill. The wolverine pausing to look back. The hunter was catching up, but each time he came over a rise, the wolverine was looking back from the next rise, just out of range. The hunter topped one more rise and met the wolverine bounding toward him. Before he could pull his rifle from its scabbard, the wolverine flew across the engine cowl and the windshield, hitting him square in the chest. The hunter scrambled his arms wildly, trying to get the wolverine out of his lap and fell over as, as he did so. The wolverine jumped clear as the snow machine rolled over and fixed the man with a stare. He had not bitten not even scratched the man. Then the wolverine walked away. The man thought of reaching for the gun, but no, he did not. <laughs> it's, a, it's a pretty wonderful story. But the relationships between relationship between men and men and wolverines, men who hunt wolverines in this in this landscape. Um, Story, storytelling, this is the art, the central argument of this Lopez piece, which okay, I'm through stealing now, I think, is, is as he says, to achieve some kind of harmony between, between the two landscapes, interior and exterior, to use all the elements of story, syntax, mood, figures of speech, um, in, in some harmonious way to, to, to represent or recreate that, that harmonious relationship between interior and, and exterior. So, it's like 9.30, that's the bulk of my talk. I just have a handful of notes on surprise in, in nature writing. And, and surprise, of course, in, in all writing, not just nature writing, comes at the level of, nat uh, uh, of language, metaphor, it, which always, you know, su metaphor should surprise. Doesn't surprise, it's probably a, a cliche, a dead metaphor. It, it, it always pairs the known to the unknown or like to unlike. Um, it's playful. Again, metaphor is almost always playful. Um, there are some wonderful, wonderful metaphors in the in the in the books that I've I've, I've given you. Um, clouds descend in the night to set a fine pelt of dew on the grasses. That's Janice Ray's Ecology of a Cracker Childhood, which I'll say more about in just a minute. Um, and in in a swamp, a thought not fully formed can poke its eyes above the water. That's Barbara Heard. Uh, Annie Dillard um, writes about a nervous gang of empty-headed turkeys. The Midwest, Michael Martone says, is a web of tissue, a membrane, a skin. Um, all, all metaphors that connect the, the human world with the, the, the natural world. Form, you know, Nature writing succeeds, it seems to me, when it does something interesting with form, doesn't just you know, g give you that same sort of narrative of man triumphing over nature, or man, in the case of Into the Wild, man being triumphed over by nature. Um, it, it just seems to me that if you're really, if you're really, really attentive to a particular place, it, it will dictate some, if not all, of the formal qualities of that work, I think of E.B. White's essay, Once More to the Lake. Just, some of you must have that in your head. Yeah, it's a wonderful essay. It's a, it's a diptych, um, mostly a diptych. I think I'm right. The, the first half is, is, you know, here was this lake in Maine that I used to go to when I was a child with my father. And the second half of the diptych is, here I am returned to the lake many years later, a father with my son, and there's a, a kind of lyric bridge connecting the two. I wish I could sing. It's a song. 
Summertime, oh, summertime, pattern of life indelible, the fade-proof lake, the woods unshatterable, the pasture with the sweet fern and the juniper forever and ever, summer without end. It is, it is of course, the song of a, of a man who's trying to persuade himself that something is true that is not really true, which is that the lake didn't change. But it's, um, it's a wonderful sort of lyric response to, to this place and to the tension it creates in him. Uh, I, Another, a, a very, very, very short piece of writing about the natural world that's, that's, that is formally, I think, really interesting is, um, is Joanne Beard's In the Current. It's an opening piece in her collection, Boys of My Youth. The Family Vacation, Heat, Flies, Sand, and Dirt. Like that. Pretty good, pretty good evocation of place. Voice, it seems to me, one of the best ways to you know, to, to work against the, 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 the posture, that fixed set of responses that Joyce Carol Oates talks about is to, is to write about nature in a voice that is almost never heard, that is not reverent or filled with awe. So I have offered you Joy Williams, in the opening of Save the, Wh Save the Whales, Screw the Shrimp, Screw the Shrimp, Save the Whales, Save the Whales, Screw the Shrimp. So much fun. You know what? Hang on. I'm, I'm, I'm going to read it. <laughs> it's, it's really delicious. This is from Ill Nature, Rants and Reflections on Humanity and Other Animals. I guess you can see that. I don't want to talk about me, of course, but it seems as though far too much attention has been lavished on you lately, that your greed and vanities and quest for self-fulfillment have been catered to far too much. You just want and want and want. You believe in yourself excessively. You don't believe in nature anymore. It's too isolated from you. You've abstracted it. It's so messy and damaged and sad. Your eyes glaze as you travel life's highway past all the crushed animals and the big gulp cups. You don't even take pleasure in looking at nature photographs these days. Oh, they can be just as pretty as always, but don't they make you feel increasingly anxious, filled with more trepidation than peace? So what's the point? You see the picture of the baby condor or the panda munching on a bamboo shoot and your heart just sinks, doesn't it? Picture of a poor old sea turtle with barnacles on her back, all ancient and exhausted, depositing her five gallons of doomed eggs in the sand, hardly fills you with joy because you realize, quite rightly, that just outside the frame falls the shadow of the condo. What's cropped from the shot of ocean waves crashing on a pristine shore is the plastics plant. And just beyond the dunes lies a parking lot. Hidden from immediate view in the butterfly bright meadow, in the dusky thicket, in the oak and hollywood are the surveyor's stakes for someone wants to build a mall exactly there. Some gas stations and supermarkets, some pizza and video shops, a health club, maybe a bulimia treatment center. <laughs> Wait, where to end that list? Bulimia treatment center. This is sort of the in, in your face. You can sense the spittle flying, right? She's, she's really angry. It's the opposite of pious. Um, last just two minutes worth of, of notes on, on beauty and nature writing. Really, just two minutes. And then we, we could talk some more if you like, or you could get away early. Um, it, it seems to me that sometimes when you're writing about place, when you're writing about landscape, the trick is to liberate it from the myths that, that are encrusting it. This is the problem with Alaska, to be boring on the subject. But it's, if, if you come from a place that is exotic and, and that much has been written about um, and that is considered very beautiful, it, you know, it's, it comes sort of caked with all this, this this language and these ideas, y you, have to, you have to rescue it from, I, I love this phrase of Lauren Slater's from deep disconnection and too much awe, because awe, of course, is about disconnection. A sense of that something is sublime is, of course, about, it, it, it's about awe. It's about disconnection. When you say something is, is beautiful or sublime, you, you, you are of, you're overpowered by it, um, overwhelmed by it, often speechless in the face of it. Um, and unable in some ways to, to make a, a kind of leap of the, of the imagination to, to, to understand the relationships between you and this place. You're just, you're sort of crushed in the face of, 
say Mount McKinley, standing at the base of Mount McKinley, looking up. Um, what's the problem with the sublime? It, it stifles us, stifles our voices and our imaginations. Ooh, this is fun. Here's a, here's, and this is just a partial list, a partial list of adjectives from a recent article about Denali National Park. It ran in AAA magazine, which I realize is a really easy target. <laughs> That's not, it's not very nice to pick on AAA magazine, but it's easy. Here, so here's, here it is. Alluring, impressive, humble, treeless, impressive, thunderous, inspiring, enormous, beautiful, and adventurous. I don't know how a park can be adventurous, but it is. And here's a partial list of the nouns. Serenity, wilderness, solace, isolation, and silence. I did a word count on that article. It is 250 words long. It's 250 words in about all those adjectives and nouns. Sometimes it seems to me the task is to, is to render an overlooked place visible and, and worthy of our attention. That's, of course, Michael Martone's task in the, the flatness and other landscapes. And Barbara Hurd's, in, in almost all of Barbara Hurd's writing, she has this book on swamps. She has another book on caves. She has another book on the, the I forgot how to say it, littoral, literal, the literal zone, the tide, tide zone, which is, they're, they're all really wonderful books. She's in, interested in edges. But to, 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 you know, to, to render a place worthy of our attention, that, that, there's that wonderful line by the Old Testament prophet <coughs> Jeremiah looking, looking at a, a, a patch of desert and saying it's, it's unbeautiful, unbeautiful because no man hath laid it to heart. Like, so the, the task of some landscapes is to, is to lay, them, lay them to heart. I, I really like writers who show me beauty where I don't expect to see it. Um, swamps and caves, a Georgia junkyard. The, you, you might look at that short excerpt from Janice Ray's Ecology of a Cracker Childhood, the nearly flat highways of, of Indiana, which I just traveled on a college trip with one of my kids. They are really flat. They are really flat, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> um, Ken Lamberton has a really, really wonderful book called Wilderness and Razor Wire about the wilderness surrounding the prison in Arizona where he was locked up for 10 years. He was a middle school science teacher who ran off with one of his students. But Wilderness and Razor Wire is a, is a really, really good book. And Damaged Landscapes, I'm pretty interested in, in you know, writing, that, writing about damaged landscape. Sometimes it seems to me the trick is just to change up the vantage point, to look at, use a different lens, to look at something from far away that people are accustomed to looking at up close or, or vice versa. Or, or as you know, Barbara Hurd urges us in that, that little excerpt from the Swamp Book, you know, instead of looking at something head on, looking at the center of it, look, look at the edge. Pay attention to the edge. To love a swamp is to love what's muted and marginal, what exists in the shadows, what shoulders its way out of mud and scurries along the damp edges of what is most commonly praised. She's married to a very great poet. She's a very great poet herself, but they must have interesting conversations. Um, <laughs> the third... The, the th you know, a third problem with beauty, and this actually is even more my problem than the first one, is, is home. But, you know, it's hard to see the place that you think of as home with fresh eyes. Home, of course, is a word that shares a root with homely. <laughs> um, it's just, it's, it's almost impossible to, to see it. Um, so much of our sense of beauty, it seems to me, is about strangeness and, and surprise and, and crossing over from, you know, strangeness to, to understand something. And home, of course, rarely surprises us. Um, I don't know the answer to that. In, in my own case, I put myself in a different relationship to, to the landscape as an adult than, than when I was a child, and that made it possible for me to, to see it differently. But I, I sometimes think that my quarrel with nature writing is, is, a, is a deeper and more problematic Quarrel, and I'm not going to say much about this, partly because I'm not sure I can, with, with beauty, with the idea and perception of beauty, it does seem to me, like, like with sub the sublime, which is, of course, beautiful, that as soon as we see something, a landscape, person, cathedral, as beautiful, we, we really stop seeing it. Um, here's, 
he's one of my favorite writers in the world. I'm going to quarrel with him in just a minute, but I, re I really like him. Scott Russell Sanders, an essay titled On Beauty. A creature, an action, a landscape, a line of poetry or music, a scientific formula, or anything else that might seem beautiful seems so because it gives us a glimpse of the underlying order of things. It's part, partly my discomfort. I'm not sure there is an underlying order often. The swirl of a galaxy and the swirl of a gown resemble one another, not merely by accident, but because they follow the grain of the universe. That grain runs through our own depths. That, that's that Lopez idea of interior and exterior landscape. What we find beautiful, Sanders says, accords with our most profound sense of how things ought to be. Ordinarily, we live in tension between our perceptions and our desires. When we encounter beauty, that tension vanishes and outward and inward images agree. It's nice writing. <coughs> so one of the ways is really my ending. One of the ways that nature writing <coughs> really goes wrong for me is that it, it doesn't stay long enough in that place of tension between external and internal, between perception and desire and the, and the, you know, the satisfaction of that desire. And so Annie Dillard has a wonderful line in her essay, um, Total Eclipse, right near the end. She says, we, we were born and bored at a stroke move from, you know, oh, that's beautiful to, okay, what's next? <laughs> Show me something even better next. Now, I, I, and I don't, know, I don't have enough distance on myself to know how much of this is just my own quirky, cranky, personal aesthetic and how much of it is a, is a critique of nature writing that might hold water. Ambivalence is my natural state of mind. <laughs> I think the only thing in the world that I'm unambivalent about is ambivalence. <laughs> but I, I and I, I, I see beauty. I mean, I get it. I see beauty in symmetry and in order. And um, you know, I, I do. But I also see it in disarray and in entropy and, and in edges and in broken things, in, in ruins. I am not alone here. Plenty of writers have written about beauty in ruins, of course. The romantics loved a good ruin. Um, but what I want from nature writing, it seems to me, may, may be inseparable from what I want from nature itself, which is, which is to, t to tweak um, or, or correct or alter my sense sometimes of, of what is beautiful. Um, I want it not to bore me. I want it not to console me. I don't go to nature for consolation. I know lots of people do. And sometimes it does console me, in the same way that writing sometimes is therapy, even though I don't intend for it to be. I, I want it to unsettle me. I, w I want nature and writing about nature to, to wake me up. I want it to scare me a little bit, and I, I want it to make me feel alive. That's that. <laughs> Questions? Worries? Criticisms? Other nature writers you'd like to offer us? I was wondering, Scott, this is, I mean, you live in Hamilton, in New York, is that correct? Uh-huh. So how would you kind of, like, uh, I noticed there's a great variety of trees on campus, and I went by the lake, and they have interesting fish that have, like, I don't know, they, they're like iridescent around the mouth. I just wondered how you would, uh, without getting too reverential, how you would talk about, you know, like if you invited some of these from here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> how do I pitch Hamilton? How, how do I? <laughs> Actually, I. The triple A brochure. The triple A brochure of Hamilton. <laughs> I, I got lost here once. It was pretty scary. I got lost up in the woods on the tea trails. Very, very shortly after I moved here, and I didn't know anybody. I didn't have anybody's phone number, and it, it was dark, and it was, I, I, it was scary. Uh, I, I have, I've written, I've, I've actually written about Alaska and, and, and this place. I mean, this, this is pastoral and, and civilized, and 
domesticated. I'm, I'm really interested in the, the contrast between the two, and I'm, uh, I'm narcissistically maybe. I'm really interested in the way that I am as a person in these two places. People are more, uh, more guarded, more, more polite, more reserved here in this, this hyper-civilized groomed place than they are in this in, in, in Alaska or, um, and, and I myself am, am not I'm not as nice there than I am here. <laughs> not, maybe I'm not being very nice in either place but I'm really not <laughs> nice there I, that's a it's a tricky it's an interesting thing to live between two landscapes that are so dissimilar Have you ever done you, you know one thing it allows you to do is to see the other more the place that you're not in much more clearly once you're away from it. It is very beautiful here. Yeah. I, I want to thank you for a wonderful, stimulating talk. Oh, thank Na you. I feel nature is one of the most difficult things to describe well. Yeah. Um, I was thinking, and, and this is only half form because there's a lot you said that I need to think about, so forgive me. But that in the Bible, and that's my feel, so um, that nature <coughs> is always participating. Mm -hmm. And so that whole, that saying of Jeremiah mm -hmm. is so striking mm -hmm. because no human has laid it to art. Mm -hmm. Because nature is either it's an actor. to the divine yeah. or to the human. You know, yeah. the trees of the field will clap their hands, yeah. the rivers rejoicing. You yeah. know, there's all this, this yeah. um, which, which really speaks to your point that if we can't relate to it, the, you know, I've stood in the, at the Grand Canyon, I've also been in Alaska, and I think your point that there is really nothing to say and there is no connection. I yeah. felt completely almost alien from it because it was so m much more yeah. than one can yeah. ever say. Yeah, yeah. That, that was very, and so that's yeah. just what my two cents were yeah. of, of that. And I'm going to look a little more into how that works in the biblical literature because, you know, they were surrounded, of course, by yeah. nature, which is kind of hostile yeah. because the land is hostile. You yeah. know, it's not easily yeah. controlled. And yeah, especially the desert. The de Richard Rodriguez has a, anybody read this? His new, what's the new book? Darling. It's all about the desert and the, and, and the ways in which people are, <laughs> religions, the, the great, great religions, uh, 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 all three, Christianity, uh, um, Islam, and, and Judaism, came out of the desert. They were people's, these, they invented these gods, sorry. The people invented these gods as a response to that incredibly, incredibly harsh, punishing landscape. That's, that's a wonderful observation, yeah. You said that your native state of Alaska, much has been written about it, it's caked with stuff. <laughs> And to me, I'm really interested in writer's block. I mean, I've spent eight years writing one book over a 14-year <laughs> period. You're going to write it. And, and so there's a long tradition of nature and culture writing. Yeah. And so you're kind of engaging with that. Like, how yeah. do you write about nature and preserve it as culture? But how does the specific that. experience of having Alaska being caked with so much writing, does that... Do you feel blocked when you try to write just because of all, all the, that has been written before? Or does that uh -huh. inspire you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did for a long time. For a long time, I, I read this work by people who, you know, came, we call it the outside, came from the outside and wrote about it. And, I, and so I looked at this place through their eyes and I thought, well, that's, that's a wonderful thing they're describing, but it's not the thing that I know. So, so maybe in, in some ways it was an incentive to me to try to try to get this <coughs> this place that I that I know. Well, that's another choice. It takes an outsider to come to your yeah. place and write about it for you, so that yeah. people who live there. Can yeah, then you have something it. to push against. That yeah. again, as I said at the beginning, for me, uh, the creative impulse is almost always about resistance. It's almost always about pushing against something else. Yeah. There have been great, it, m many people have come from the outside and written beautifully about Alaska, I should say. Not, not all, but many. <laughs> Brian? I've been thinking since the 
very beginning, since you were talking about the writing exercise, I haven't written anything while you were talking, but um, trying to think of you know the landscape that somehow, and I wonder, since you know the genre so well, whether someone has, has, has done something similar to what, what I realized about my deepest, the, 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 the kind, the landscape that brings out the sort of most hard to read, inarticulate, but, but intensely numinous feeling. I grew up entirely in the suburbs. Um, we, my family never went anywhere. We never went camping. Um, so that was, that was absolutely what I knew. But the thing that calls it up is not, is not my suburbs. It's Charlie Brown's suburb. Is it really? Wow. Charlie Brown's suburb is the platonic ideal huh. of my landscape. It was and like the moon to me when I was growing up. And, and <laughs> it was like the moon. It was so alien to my growing up. I see either those old cartoons or similar cartoons that, that depict suburban landscapes. Yeah. Or the old Dick and Jane books. Really? I, I'm just bowled over with feelings of of like I'm staring into some kind of, it's not, it's not that it looks necessarily like paradise, huh. but it just looks like the source of all meaning. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's, it's, I could never write that. I could never, I, I could never write that. I saw, I mean, I rode in planes before I, I ever saw taxis. I never saw, I didn't see a taxi until I was 10. I mean, I never, I never saw, I didn't see cows till I was a teen a teenager, so the, 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 the landscape that's most important to them, but it's basically a literary uh, version. Yeah. I mean, it, it is a landscape, but it's a literary version of the landscape, which is the one that has sort of yeah. nestled in there. Yeah. Well, I think that's probably what Michael Martone is up to in the, in the flatness, but I, I think there are people who've written wonderfully about the landscape of cities and, and suburbia. Patricia Hampel's The Florist's Daughter is one, wonderful writing about St. Paul, the city that's growing up in Saint, that hilly city with the McClastry, or Annie Dillard's yeah. An American Childhood. And, I mean, it, it doesn't, like I said, just, just for the sake of argument and because it's what I know best, I was talking about wilderness. but there, Am I, am I getting at what you're saying, though? Because you, you, you're asking something slightly different, though, well, which is that it's... The idea that it's my it, landscape isn't a real landscape. Yeah. But it still yeah. is... My, it, it is the... Yeah. If I was to answer the question honestly and do my, most deeply, it, it, it has to be... It has to be Charles Schultz's version. That's so interesting. It was similar enough to what I grew up in. Yeah. That's the one that burrowed deep. So Rather interesting. Have you written about this? You got to write about this. <laughs> John? I hadn't thought about it much until you started talking. Yeah, about that's it. a great essay. I actually think that Brian's imaginary landscape is every bit as real as they and Anthony. Yeah, right? of course. You know, and I kept thinking when you, when you were complaining about this uh, mysterious nature writer uh, at the beginning of your talk about, the, about this, uh, you know, reading an essay that is essentially about going down to the river and get some water on fire. I could. I can move myself writing an essay about driving to the supermarket to buy a case of puzzle nails. You know, it's a, it is essentially an experience. Yeah. I think that once you, once you write about the city or the suburbs and that environment, yeah. that environment, yeah. you don't write with this breathless assumption yeah. that, pe that you, one should be moved by it. Yeah, yeah, you know? that's and exactly that's, right. You know, that's, that, and that's the kind of writing that ends up moving me, one that doesn't Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Less well done in nature writing can, ha can hold this assumption. And yeah. Any, any time a piece of writing seems to want me to feel something, yeah. I react, you react I yeah. aggressively. Yeah, not. you tear that arm away from you. Yeah, get away from me. You know what? I think, I think what you just said is clarified for me in some ways why, why, why Zabald works in The Rings of Saturn, where he says, I'm. I'm just going to walk the county of Suffolk here. Come with me. I don't. I don't know Suffolk. I don't know that close. I don't. I don't know it at all. And that. That is. That is incredibly compelling narrative. The only thing that's in but he's not grabbing me. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, every absolutely. 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 Yeah, but he's not hanging on your arm saying, you should think this is wonderful just because it's me out in nature, stroking, stroking nature. It doesn't have, it's not lit by that little glow that says, you know, this is virtuous writing. Yeah. Somehow that passage you read, The Walking Suffolk, struck me as the opening sentence of Moby Dick, exactly. Huh. You know, going to the country part of the world. Yeah. You know, yeah. knocking people's hats off. And he may have been conscious of that. Yeah. yeah. The Quibbly comment. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. So at the at the beginning, you had a, a quote there about names not mattering. No, right. no. I said I have no head for names. I didn't say they uh, don't matter. But there's, but there's oh, and Lopez says, says it doesn't Lopez matter. Says yeah. It's about yeah. it's about the relationships, not the names, right? Yeah. Um, and so, 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 so here's the biologist. <laughs> here's the biologist. Says, if you get the names wrong, you don't know did it right. about the relationship. Yeah, that's right. 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 Way out. Give us an example. Way out in Lala. Of a, of a name of a name that expresses the relationship. Um, so, um, the the one that comes to my mind is me. Is what? <laughs> um, so so if you, um, if I read a piece of nature writing and somebody assumes that, um, that bees and hornets and wasps are all the same things, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. right? Then I get, then I get thrown out, yeah. and I worry about something being missing, right? Um, if I, and for me, it's often plants, where, where, um, where, if you just look something up for a moment, often it can bring you to places where yeah. you find something oh, about a relationship that is allegorical in a way that that makes you go deep very very fast, mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. you're right um, and so so um so things can matter and i i i feel like they're worth anybody's time i think you're absolutely right good, good to remind us of that thank you all very much have a lovely day <laughs>